Ramsey first asked me to, to do this talk, it was set up that we we're going to have a CEO from the top Silicon Valley, or an ex-CEO of the top Silicon Valley company. And I was going to ask a few questions and just sort of try and get the best out of this person. And then sadly, due to change of circumstances, you've just got me now. And I've had to suddenly sort of think about this topic in a very different way. And I realized on the way here that this actually, talking about achievement, success and achievement, is really a culmination of every talk that I've done in this whole series over this last year. Now some of you have been to some of my talks before, and some of you haven't, so tonight is really going to be a summation of that. And I've written, I thought we were going to be in the other room with a different board. So I apologize for such a small um, flip chart there. Maybe if anyone's interested, they can take a photo afterwards. But basically, I'm going to have to go through with you and basically say, I think that all these aspects that I've written up on the flip chart here, I keep wanting to say the white flip chart, it's not, it's a flip chart. On the flip chart here are aspects that are crucial for success now, some of you are probably interested in success in business. Some of you are probably interested in success in you know, romantic affairs. Some of you in friendship, all sorts of areas. The principles are all going to be the same. So what I suggest, I think the way of getting the best value in tonight's talk is to take stock of each of these and, what, and ask yourself, how much of this do I have in my life? Have I got a deficit here? Do I need to work more on this? Or actually am I doing quite well here? Now success and achievement in sort of, in the positive psychology field is really about the attainment or the achievement of goals. Setting goals and getting those goals. So I want you to just hold that in mind throughout the whole of tonight's talk. If you want to achieve anything, you need a sense of resilience. Now, I define resilience, as many people do, as the ability to draw upon internal and external resources. An internal resource might be a, a thinking style or thinking method. So you are in an adverse situation, and do you have integrated into yourself an ability to challenge some of maybe that negative thinking that comes up that's telling you you can't do it, this is too hard? Psychology of success? Yeah. 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 So you may be thinking, I can't do this, or this is too hard, or maybe this is too hard. Do you have a set of tools to be able to challenge that kind of thinking? Because there are certain, I'll give you a really simple I was working with someone today, and they your textbook, uh, textbook catastrophizing. And there's a really simple technique that, that works nearly every time. They, they got themselves into a very tricky situation. Their, the, their past was catching up with them. They had made significant changes, but their past, certain elements from fed, say five, ten years ago that they're not too proud of, potentially catching up with them. So they had every, every right to to be uh, concerned, anxious, and also feeling some guilt and shame for that time. So I asked them, and this isn't, this isn't from me, this comes from Karen Rybich, it's very, just a very simple, simple technique. So okay, so you're catastrophizing here. <coughs> Ask yourself, what's the very, very worst thing that can happen? And they said what it is. I said, write it down. Okay, what's the least bad outcome of this that's still not saying, oh, it's going to go away, but like, what's the sort of the best, least bad catastrophe in your mind? Write that down. Then look at that and ask yourself, which is the most likely? Now, sometimes the most, li the most likely might be the very worst, and it might be the better one, or it might be somewhere in between. But the very act of writing it down gives you the chance to see it more clearly. From that, you can start making plans, and that would be that would be a resilience tool of literally planning for the most likely catastrophe. That being an example of just a, a cognitive approach that you could take in terms of resilience. 
there are many other aspects of resilience. I always say that probably the most fundamental aspect of resilience that trumps every other is how well you sleep. Sleep is the number one factor in, in determining your mental and physical resilience. Then there are all sorts of techniques you can have or use, like mindful breathing, uh, how to fitness, all these kind of things. But really, you know, have a look <coughs> at the resilience and really have write down, identify, and make conscious all your resources that you have, and ask yourself, do I have enough? In, in, do I have enough internal resources and do I have enough external resources? And then ask yourself, where can I get help in either of those if I can? That humility sometimes is, is crucial. Self-esteem. Anyone who's going to succeed is going to need a high self-esteem. Now self-esteem is best in a simple way to describe self-esteem. Self-esteem is believing that you have enough skills to meet the challenges of life and am I worthy of that? And it's really these questions that most people don't ask. People just say, oh, I want more self-esteem. I want more self-esteem. They don't really ask themselves what it is and how to get it. But it's, it's crucial to break yourself break yourself, to break it down into two parts, self-esteem. Am I able and am I worthy? And ask yourself, do I have a deficit in either of those areas? <coughs> am I able? Am I up to the task? If not, what am I going to do about it? What help am I going to get? What am I going to work on so that I am able? Now, does anyone here know the fastest way to boosting self-esteem? Yes. Action. Action. What kind of action? Do what you're afraid of. Do what you're afraid of. Okay. Joseph. Do small tasks and then you succeed in it. Yes. You're both right. But the, it's the setting of goals and achieving those goals. And, and, and starting off with small goals. There's nothing like achievement of the small goal to boost your self-esteem. And you keep integrating that, you keep integrating that. And you, then the worthiness side of self-esteem increases. Now it's really important to identify with self-esteem where the issues of am I worthy, where, where could they lie? Now they could lie in like severe childhood trauma. You, you could be very able in many ways, you have this message in the back of your head that tells you you're not worthy and you're not good enough. And I'm afraid the, uh, the earlier the damage, the harder it is to fix. A child is uh, abused and they internalize that there's something wrong with them. We hear this all the time. A child cannot comprehend for example, a primary caregiver being a bad person or being in some context evil or destructive or abusive, that's too much. A child would have a psychic break if they really absorb that. So one of the coping strategies that most children, most abused children take on is that they tell themselves that they're bad, that there must be some reason that they haven't identified it themselves, that they're being punished. Now, if you think that, that, that can start being integrated at sort of two and a half, three years old. So, when working with self esteem, we have to really sometimes go very deep in working on the, what issues there are around worthiness. Because you, you might be able to tell yourself actually I'm worthy, but you still, it still doesn't work. Now, I'm going to be going quite fast today, so if people have questions, please say them to the end. I'm going to make sure there's plenty of time for questions today. It's something that I, I, in my work, I see is the biggest struggle with self-esteem. It's not actually having skills to be able to do things, but just believing that it's even worth bothering. Because you know, <coughs> does anyone here know what positive?
affect is So the ability to take that on from somewhere else, someone else. Now, if you want to, to achieve and be successful, you have to be able to tolerate positive emotions. I bet there's a lot of people in this room that if I, if I were to pay you a compliment, you'd bat it away and say, yeah, but, etc. Yeah, nice shirt. Yeah, but my, my jeans are a bit scrappy. You want to be able to succeed, you've got to be able to say thank you and hold that. And I have end up doing a lot of work with people around positive affect. It's actually, look, most people often you find are actually much better at taking negative than they are at absorbing and holding on to positive affect. So you, some people are going to have to, if you want to succeed, really work on that. And there are exercises you can do with that. You can actually, first of all, take a log of every compliment that was paid to you over a day. Because you actually, when you take when you take direct awareness to an, to, some, to an activity like that, you'll find that it's actually much more common than you think. And then write down journal how you responded. <coughs> Did I bat it off? Did I say thank you? Did I engage and ask why? Or did I go red? Did I leave the room, etc.? Really paying attention to how you respond to compliments, to any form of being hugged or anything like that. Because if you can't hold on to that, you're not going to be able to hold on to the praise you're going to get if you achieve in any area. And I'm not just talking about, say, in business or in sport, etc. I'm talking about just you know, in all of your relationships, etc. You cannot tolerate positive affect relationships are really going to struggle. The better and higher your self-esteem is, the easier it will get to do that. And optimism. If you want to succeed, you've got to be optimistic. Now, in positive psychology, there's two types of optimism that are sort of recognized. There's dispositional optimism, which is just, ah, uh, the, the glass is half full. I was just a kind of happy, cheery kind of guy, etc. That's just the way they are. She's always been like that, she always will, etc. And that's just been shown to be nonsense. It's the one that we've all been brought up with, but it's actually it's pretty meaningless. The optimism that we're talking about and is, is how we explain how events happen. And I refer you to Sullivan's work on optimism. Because <coughs> it's an excellent book on optimism digest and it's quite easy to read but basically it ultimately comes down to do I have agency in any action do I have free will am I able to make choices here was I a causal agent in what happened or just do things just happen by chance and outside of my control because if you want to succeed in anything you've got to believe that you have an element of control and choice in the things that you do so I really explain how every event happens, how you explain how the good events in your life happen, and how you explain how the bad events. Because if you look at the research, optimists, if you divide the population up into four groups, and you look at the most, you have the most optimistic, and then semi-optimistic, and then semi-pessimistic, and then fully pessimistic, you find, and you, this is all measured through standardized biometric tests. This isn't just like a general hunch, by the way. Um, you find that those who are in the, the top optimistic quartile live about 20 years longer than those in the pessimistic quartile. So if you want to have a successful life and live a long time, be optimistic. Anyone know why that might be the case? Because you're looking for yeah. upside to the glass bowl. Sure. But anyone 
don't know why why is such a, why twenty years why is such a huge differential there. They have less anxiety because they don't experience Yeah, they do. They have less anxiety. And what does stress most likely to lead to? Cortisol. Cortisol and heart attacks. Stress. Over a lifetime, a lifetime's pessimism is going to have a hell of a negative impact on your nervous system <coughs> compared to a lifetime's optimism. You want to succeed? Change your thinking style. Make sure, and, and those of you who think you're optimistic, I used to think I was very optimistic, and then I did some of the optimism tests, and I realized well, I found out that I wasn't at all. I was kind of semi-pessimistic. If you, if you, if you want to go and take these tests, uh, take the optimism one, I would recommend you go to the University of Pennsylvania, Authentic Happiness. So if you put it in Google, Authentic Happiness, University of Pennsylvania, Take the optimism test. It'll show you explanatory style in uh, various components. I haven't got time to go into it right now, but I really recommend it. It's very interesting. I found it very interesting to see where I, where I stood. And what I do in my, I had to check, I have to change the way. My, it's working a lot with your unconscious thinking style, if, you know, those things that are automatic. And you can change that by uh, a lot of sort of CBT techniques on your own. Um, and it's amazing how, how quickly things change there. You have to learn how to dispute your own thoughts. They call it disputation in CBT. You need to learn how to really look at the full, allow yourself to look at the full picture instead of always going to the automatic first thought that you have. So I, I would say that resilient self-esteem and optimism are kind of base pillars that you need in place for anything else to be able to flourish and therefore succeed. How many of you in here are familiar with the PERMA model? Okay. The PERMA model is again something that, that came out of Dr. <coughs> Martin Salgren's work. And he says there are five key components that everybody needs if they want to flourish. And they, those five things are positive emotion, engagement, also known as flow in the research, positive relationships, so we all need plenty of relationships, but particularly positive relationships are really important. What's very interesting is flourishing people always report that they have many, many types of relationship. And one of the reasons that relationships are so important is that other people are of great value to you. We get, we get so much from each other. So much learning, support, uh, humor, love, sex, all these kind of things are of, of tremendous value to all of us. So you need to pick the right people, the people whose values you share. But what they also found is that people who really flourish have all types of relationship. So they don't just have their schoolmates. We all know those people that never seem to leave their school friends. They have friends from school, they have friends from their um, sort of familial upbringing. They have friends from university <coughs> if they went there, they have friends from work. They have older friends, they have younger friends, they have relationships that, where someone is almost like a mentor. They have relationships where there's like an apprentice, etc. And they're absolutely okay in all of those types of relationships. They cultivate them. And what's the other thing that I find really interesting is that people at first are absolutely okay with relationships ending if that's the natural course they take. Now, I work, I, in my work, I seem to see a lot of people who want to hold on to a particular time in their life. It, in my experience, it tends to be that year between school and further education. That sort of first great year of sort of independence, getting out of home, traveling, all those things. And there's a lot of people who just want to sort of recapture all the relationships that were cemented in that time. And I'm afraid that that's going to lead to a lot of uh, heartbreak. Because people change. And people's values change and people's direction in life changes. And 
your lives will as well. And trying to hold on to that is a recipe for disaster. I just see this happen all the time. But cultivating positive relationships, find people who uh, share your values. When people, I also get this a lot. I get people who, who come out of long-term relationships. You know, they were married for 20 years, and they're like, what the hell am I going to do now? How the hell am I going to find people to, to be with? And usually the, the, the things that really work are, are people uh, joining things like a, either a book club, because they're sharing a love of literature, or just as importantly, you know, what I, I had a client who, very, very severe borderline personality disorder, really struggled to hold and maintain relationships, utterly miserable, been coming to therapy for quite a long time, and I was thinking, you're just not getting anywhere. I think, I just don't think this, any of this is really working, you know. And I, I sort of, in a sort of throwaway comment, I said, you know, have you ever thought about, you used to love sport, have you ever thought about joining a, joining a, a team? You know, just a sort of amateur local team. And about three weeks later, they came back and they said, do you know what I have? I didn't tell you because I thought I was going to sabotage it and I thought I wasn't going to turn up and I thought and I thought, you know, all this stuff going, negative chains of thinking. But they actually did it. And um, this person's esteem went through the roof. I've never seen such a turnaround. And it was because they were really good at that sport when they were younger. And that was still in them, it was still in the muscle memory. They got that sense of achievement because they actually went and won two cups that year. They scored the most points. They made new friends. And that's, that was one of the key things. They made new friends around something that they all valued. They valued the hard work they put into it. They valued, they valued the sharing of joy in winning. They valued the effort that they all put in. And from that, these new friendships grew. And I say that to anyone in any stage of your life. If you want to make a change, do the activities and the friends will follow. <coughs> do it that way around. Don't try and make the friends and then find the friends who might want to come climbing with you or something. Go to the climbing wall and there will be people there that you'll make friends with. And that boost your resilience and your esteem and hopefully it will help you realise that you can make choices and then you're more likely to take an optimistic start in your life. Positive emotion. Sorry, M is the poem model. Meaning. Does your life have meaning? If you want to succeed, you've got to have a purpose. You've got to have something that gets you out of bed every day. Now if you're really struggling, it doesn't have to be a huge gigantic purpose, it could just be getting through today. But to really delve into meaning, meaning and purpose in your life, I really implore you, if you haven't done this or even know about it, to write down and explore something we call a values hierarchy. And the really simple way to do this is to write down on a piece of paper. It's pro probably the most powerful tool I've ever used in therapy. And it, again, it's not an idea of mine, it actually comes directly from Ayn Rand. Not this exercise, but the concept of the values hierarchy. Write down just everything that you love, and everything that you have loved, and all the things that maybe you want to do, and all the other things that you value. You know, do you value, write down the abstract things as well. Write down all the arts that you value. Write down all the sports that you value. Write down all the people you value. Write down all the activities. Maybe you love travel. Maybe you love reading. Or maybe you love politics. Whatever it is, write them all down. And some of them will, you'll be able to cluster. Because, you know, I've had some people do this and they have about five things on there. And I've had other people have like 50 things on there. Cluster some of the similar things. And then literally <coughs> put them in order of importance to you. <clears throat> and from that, you'll find, or it will be 
starting point of really determining your purpose and meaning in life. Angela Duckworth from the University of Pennsylvania talks about three, three types of goals. She talks about the ultimate goal, which maybe you could describe as your life, but in, in a sort of subcategory of that, and it usually it's your work and your family. And then she talks about mid-goals. Those are the ways of achieving those higher goals. And then she calls the, what she calls the lower or sub-goals. And then she says that the mid-goals and the higher goals need to be fixed. It's the sub or lower goals that you move around all the time. She says, you know, we have the, this phrase, try, 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 try again. She's like, try, 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 change. If the lower goals that are feeding those mid and higher goals aren't working, keep moving those around. And I think she's right, and I really um, think she's someone who is worth exploring. Um, which brings me on to grit. Now, <coughs> Angela Duckworth wrote the best-selling book that's in all bookstores at the moment called Grit. Has anyone read that? Grit. Yeah. Yeah, by Angela Duckworth. Yeah. And grit can be can be seen as it's, it's an interesting concept. Uh, it's also just tenacity, but it can really it, think of grit as perseverance in the perseverance in the activity of achieving your long-term goals. It's that emphasis on perseverance. People who are gritty are the people who succeed the most. Now, what's very interesting is the research shows that IQ has a small part to play in achievement of goals, but actually effort is the number one factor that overrides everything else. Now, there are various people who are born with talent. We could say one is born with talent. You know, there are some people who, if you take intelligence, what is intelligence? Well, the latest thinking on what intelligence is is actually the speed at which you're able to integrate or process information. You know, there's some people you see who just told something once and they get it. And they're able just to integrate that and move on to the next thing. And there are other people who take a while to get it. That is an important factor. But if you don't do anything with it, it doesn't matter. And she's got a nice formula that talent Times effort creates skill. And it's skill is those parts of you, those parts of being an activity that you've, that you've made automatic, you've automatized. And by being and that comes from lots and lots of what we call deliberate practice. And I'm sure many of you were made to practice playing the piano or something similar when you were younger and probably found it a bit of a chore. And some of you probably loved it, and some of you are in between. But the same in sport, the same in anything, that if you keep practicing, you keep practicing, you keep practicing, you keep practicing an activity, it becomes automatized. And what Sullivan says, which I think is right, is that the more, the more processes that you have automatized, allows you, your intelligence, is what the intelligence is there to, to move through things quicker. It gives you more space to then be able to work, work on those things that are really hard. So you need to have the automatized actions, and then you need from that to be able to create the space to then really be able to focus on the, that part which is really hard or difficult for you to do. Now if you think those people who are able to, to whiz through things and then have that space, how are going to achieve a lot more? So we want, so deliberate practice is crucial in automatizing. And then being able to slow down is another crucial piece. So here we are saying you've got to get much faster, and you've also got to be able to learn the skill of really slowing down. And I'd say that the best skill for learning how to slow down is mindfulness. Now we hear about mindfulness all the time. I, I was actually, my business has been featured in one of the uh, mindfulness magazines called Calm, and I was uh, looking for 
copy because I just want to see what they've written, etc. And I went to a magazine store the other day, and there must have been about 30 different magazines of mindfulness now. And it's, I'm, it's a bit of a minefield. I obviously couldn't find. There's my exit. Sorry, there, there I'm being pessimist. I couldn't find the, the issue that I wanted because it sold out. That's my optimistic way of looking at it. Um, <clears throat> but mindfulness has become a bit of a blurry, fuzzy concept. But if you go, go back to what it is, particularly in sort of clinical psychology, it's really uh, a form of introspection. It's the ability to not to bring awareness to what's going on internally or externally. So it's not just introspection, it's extrospection as well. But bringing deliberate focus without judgment. And that <laughs> skill of being able to focus and not judge it in that moment allows you to expand your awareness. And that expansion of awareness gives you the ability to be, to be able to solve many problems that come up for you. And it's in the solving of the problems that leads you to I hope the achievement that maybe you're looking for. <coughs> Grit implies, but it isn't exclusive to you, having a an open mindset. Do people know about fixed and open mindsets? It's finally becoming accepted these days that actually um, we don't have a fixed mindset. For a long, long time, well, until Gage's work when they discovered the mirror neurons in the brain. <coughs> and the London taxi cab experiments, do people know about that? Yep. And the expansion of the hippocampus. Yep. But before these, these famous experiments in the late 90s and early 2000s, the general consensus was that the brain was fixed once you reached that off it. And that was it. And when you knocked your head and, and some brain cells died, that was it. Nothing was really going to change in terms of your brain. And then from that, extrapolated that your mind wasn't going to change. Most people who believe in mind. But what they have discovered, so it's very new, the new in neuroscience, although a lot of people have sort of known this on a, on, a, on a less conscious level, is that the brain is actually plastic in this concept of neuroplasticity. Is that we can't actually change the structures of our brain and the way we think, and, and certain cognitive tools that we do from writing, etc. Now, a classic example in my work of this at play is that um, someone comes in for a uh, drug addict, comes into treatment, and one of the uh, main aspects or one of the main symptoms of addiction, addictive disease, is it's one of the only illnesses that tells you that you don't have it. Now, most of you have probably come across someone who said, you know, I'm not drunk when they're wasted. Yeah, but they, gen they generally believe they're not drunk. But that's, you know, a very small element of what we call the denial that is associated with addiction. Which is the belief that the drugs or the alcohol, etc., aren't the problem. It's always the bank manager or the boss or the girlfriend or the boyfriend or whatever it is. And the, 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 the addict in full bone active addiction really genuinely believes that all the issues out there have got nothing to do with the addictive processes that they're engaged in. And to break that denial, to change, really to change the whole thinking and the neural pathways in the brain, we will ask them to write out time and time, you know, example after example, times of the, when they've been what this concept we call powerlessness. <coughs> Examples of when you've been powerless. Okay, I, I plan to meet my brother for a quick drink on the way home after work, and as soon as I had that quick drink, I had another one, then I had another one, then I had another one, and then I woke up two days later. One example. Right now. And what were the consequences of that example? The consequences, for instance, I got a warning at work. I forgot to pay my bills. I lost my mobile phone. I left my laptop in a cab. All these kind of things. Keep them. The rewriting of example after example after example after example helps rewire the brain 
And after a while, Daddy goes, do you know what? I think I've got a problem. It literally changes the thinking. And it changes what's going on up here. Because you're making it easier to believe what you can now see. Yeah. You're trying to make yourself see stuff that you're not inclined to. Absolutely. It's, it, well, it breaks the denial of the reality. It brings awareness to the reality of the situation. But this is a massive change. This is a great example of a, cha a change in mindset. <coughs> Huge changes in mindset of someone who believes that the whole world is like, out to get them and, and nothing they do makes any difference and that, that society's fault or whatever, which is what I hear time and time and time again in rehab, to, well, I've got a part to play in this. I've got choices here. I'm one of those types of people that one is too many and a thousand never enough. I'm in that category of person who cannot drink, who cannot take drugs, because when I do, this happens. That's a huge shift, and that comes from literally change, change in mindset. But to go back to the context of tonight's talk, do you have an open mindset or a closed mindset? If you've got a closed mindset, it's very unlikely that you're going to succeed in this thing. Because everything is predetermined that way. An open mindset goes hand in hand with, with free will, the choice, the ability to focus your mind and then make decisions from that awareness that, you come, that comes up from focusing your mind. <coughs> now, goal settings. All of this leads up to being able to set goals. Now, if you have a low self-esteem, you're not going to set any goals. So you're probably going to tell yourself, What's the point? You're not going to be able to do it anyway. So if we go all the way back to the beginning, one of the things and Joseph said, it's setting those small goals to build up your capacity and belief in the goal setting process. And if you've already got that, I'd say that the most important goals, well, one of the most important aspects of setting goals is that they've got to be rational goals. And that's where smart goals come in. And I think most people who know anything about goal setting have come across SMART goals. Do people in the room know about SMART goals? There's quite a lot of few people nodding here. But their SMART goals, some people query some of the, the letters, but if you're going to set a goal, make sure it's specific. Make sure it's measurable, that it's achievable, that it's realistic, and then it's time frame. Time framing is really important. If, if, if you get the time framing wrong, you often never bother to do something. In my experience, that's pretty true. You know, if, you, if you say, oh, I'm gonna do that in like three, five, three years time, <coughs> I won't do anything for two and three, 40 years. Just, just the way it seems to be pretty universal. Right? So if I, give the, I always often give this example when people challenge or don't quite get smart goals. I'm going to say, okay, my goal is to be an astronaut. What do you reckon? I've got a thumbs up in the front. <laughs> I'm too late. I'm too late. <coughs> but is that, goal, is that goal to become an astronaut, is it specific? Yeah, it's pretty specific. Yeah. Is it measurable? Oh, well, either I'm in space or I'm not at some point. I was reading an article about the apparently um, Virgin Galactic aren't going to technically take you into space, and there's going to be a big argument about whether you, but they're selling it that you're going to be an astronaut. But if you're not quite going past some line, you're not an astronaut, and they're, they're going to be sued for saying you're an astronaut and all this sort of stuff. But there is, there is apparently a measurable line of when you become a, I think it's 100 kilometers up, whereas Virgin Galactic. Galactic and take you 80 kilometers. So let's say I, I, it is measurable if I cross that 100 kilometer line. Is it achievable? Depends if I'm rich. Yeah, so it's kind of achievable, but like for me. I mean, how much does it cost to, to do? $250,000. $250,000. 
So if I sell my house and starve, <laughs> maybe. But is it realistic? If, let's say I wanted to be a NASA astronaut. It's just not realistic because I'm way too old. Yeah, but just that I, I, I'm too old. I'm too old. Even though I've got 20 20, but let's just say, take my eyesight. I've got 20 20 vision, but I'm 42, so my eyes are going to be gone quite soon. So I'm not going to become an Just on that front. You know, even people with 20 20 vision, apparently, the, the eyes go in your, your mid 40s and forget about it. Also, I'm a man. You've got much more chance these days of being an astronaut if you're a woman. <laughs> Uh, physiological reasons. You're a, young woman. a young woman is more likely than a young man. I do. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that. But, um, so it's not very realistic in the time frame element. Uh, I use a, a sort of sillyish example like that just to make it makes a point and you can go into it. But make your goals smart. Make them specific, measurable, <laughs> actionable, realistic, and time frame, and you'll get there. Make sure they're rational goals. I mean, that that smart implies rational rationality. Now, does anyone know about OKRs in business? I'm no expert on business psychology, but anyone know about OKRs? Objective key. Objectives yeah. and key results, which is like being one of the biggest turnarounds in business. So I'm not going to talk too much about OKRs, but I suggest, really suggest that you look up OKRs, objectives and key results, and the history of their implementation business is absolutely <coughs> extraordinary, how powerful they've been. And you can actually take, you can extrapolate those principles and use them in anything. It doesn't just have to be in business. But to really sum up that if you've got a project you want to succeed, you need an objective. That has to be well defined, very similar to what Angela Dove was talking about with grit and the goals that your ultimate goal has to, and your mid goals have to be defined. So with OKRs, make sure that the objective is well defined. You want to be the I don't know what, what okay, so, uh, you want to be the number one think tank in the UK. That's the objective. And the key results is the bit, the, the, the tasks that you set, the sort of micro goals of that, and that's the bit that you keep changing. So you see there's a lot of synergy between the these. The principles are pretty much the same. Motivation. We need motivation to achieve our goals. Do people know about internal and external motivation? Who in the room is who's got good internal motivation? Amy, I mean, what would you say is the an example of that, or what drives that? The joy of learning new things, for example, learning so a skill, being good at something, enjoying the actual work. So enjoying the actual actual work, and so it's a value to you. Yeah. So I mean, we find that internal motivation is mostly guided by your value system those things that you really value and hold dear to you. So go back to the values hierarchy to make sure you've got that all in place and that really boosts your internal motivation. You know, the, the why you want to do it and how you're going to get there. And those aspects. External motivation. What would be an example of that? Art. Sorry? Art. 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 Yeah. Art is often, uh, <coughs> art is that, interestingly enough, art is often a very uh, powerful um, tool in group resilience, using art to inspire and give you that energy to, um, you know, when, when you're a kid, um, usually you're inspired by like, you know, Harry Potter or comic book heroes, such a large, <coughs> large characters, and they can give you, oh, I'm going to be like Batman, and it gives you that little extra impetus, and when we get older, we replace those kind of characters with, usually with art. Art gives us that boost. External motivation is just really, you know, like, am I gonna get in trouble if I don't do this? Um, 
Or it can be something like, that's the date of the London Marathon. And that's, that's there. And if, if, if I don't train in time, you know, that, that date is coming closer and closer and closer, and that motivates me. And what we find there is that for real achievement, you need, you need to have internal and external motivators both. And I often find, talking to people, that they say they're internal. Some people might say, yeah, I've got really good internal motivation. I know, I know what my values are. I know what I really want to do. But I don't really ha I haven't really set up things to help drive me along with that. And vice versa. You know, a lot of people have said, yeah, I, 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 I hate pain. And I know that if I don't do that, it's going to cause a lot of pain. But uh, I'm a bit flat in the internal motivation. So, so again, bringing awareness to that. will help you in your motivation to achieve these goals. And finally, uh, self-care. We kind of often have this romanticized view that the person who really achieves and does really well, that, that you know, they're, they're in the office till midnight every day, seven days a week. And it makes a good copy, and it makes a good story. But actually, um, Usually a lot of these people burn out. Uh, it works in drama, but in real life it doesn't work that well. So self-care, and a lot of people, this goes back to self-esteem, am I worthy? And we say, well, what's the point? Am I worth looking after? But if you've got that mindset, you're not very likely to succeed. So we have to look at our self-care, and, and when you're what happens with a lot of people is actually their, their worthiness, their, their, how much they like themselves, increases. But they still have very poor self-care um, traits. Now again, because I work a lot of rehab, I see this stuff. An example of someone's self-care coming back would be illustrated by someone saying, do you know what, I started brushing my teeth twice a day now. That would be a really like, low-level example of, of self-care coming back. Checking on nutrition. Am I eating well? You know, am I, if I want to be productive and do well, am I at lunchtime eating slow release carbohydrate or quick release carbohydrate? Am I sleeping well? When did you last go on holiday? When did you last have a massage, if that's your thing? Or, or it might be necessary for you to have one. When did you last exercise? When did you last go and enjoy some, some art? You know, when we talk about art, we talk about music, cinema, TV, painting, reading books, etc. But that, that psychological fuel is very important as a part of self-care. Am I... Some people, or a lot of people, when they're incredibly motivated, spend too much time in the future not actually living in the present. Am I actually doing some activities where I'm really just enjoying and savoring? Which brings to positive emotion there. Do I have good savoring skills? Am I able to connect to a positive emotion or remember a positive emotion and bring that back up again? Am I doing activities where I get into flow. Uh, this isn't a flow lecture, but flow is uh, those activities where you're completely at one with something. And time stands still, and you're really focused and at your very best. And from that, you often derive a very euphoric feeling when you come out of the flow state. But am I doing activities? Flow becomes an end in itself. It becomes this incredibly pre pleasurable state. Am I cultivating Those are, all, you know, those are just as crucial elements of self-care as are showering every day and brushing your teeth and getting a good night's sleep. So I've bombarded you today with a lot of different <coughs> things that all come together to generate and point you in the direction of success and achievement. And what I'm hoping is that maybe you've 
you promise you've got, actually, you're doing pretty well in a lot of those. Maybe even better than I thought. And there's other areas where I think, actually, I really need to, to draw some focus and, and explore further, bring my awareness to chew on that. Um, see, what I, see whether what I've been saying to you today is real or not. Whether you agree with me. Whether there's something I want to go and research. Or I want to know more about. Or maybe, maybe I realise that actually I can't even start thinking about these bits down here until I've got these sorted. Do I even know what some of these things mean? I don't know. But what I can say to you is that if you have these things in place, you're going to succeed pretty much anything that you want to do. And um, I found this to be true in my life, and I know many other people have found this to be true. So I implore you to start looking at this. And I think the best thing to do now is to open it up to questions to those of you who, who are interested. Thank you.